Hello and welcome to this very special episode of the Edu Futurist podcast. Uh, it's great to be with you. Uh, and we've got a very special guest, uh, as you can see right below me, uh, who we're going to introduce now. Uh, this is Joshua Dan. Joshua uh, ha- is just delivered the, the keynote at the Edu Futurist Awards 2021. So if you were if you were joining us for that, then we hope you enjoyed it. If not, you can catch that on YouTube. Just go to Edu Futurists YouTube channel, so youtube.com forward slash Edu Futurists. Josh is the executive director and founder of Astronova School in Los Angeles, California. The Astronova School is a successor to Ad Astra, the school Josh set up with Elon Musk at SpaceX. Yeah, he's also the co-founder of Synthesis. We're really, really excited to talk about this. Uh, A company that brings students together from around the world to learn through complex games. Josh, it's great to have you on the show. How are you doing? Uh, It's it's morning there in California, uh, evening here in the UK. Um, Yeah, how's it going over there? Going well. Delighted to be with you all. Yeah, um, it's 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 great to have you on, and, and we're going to delve into to a lot of cool stuff. I hope it'll be great to kind of go into your journey, and then maybe talk about kind of some of the pedagogy around the the the, the stuff that you do around problem solving and kind of how you're tackling that. Um, so yeah, let's jump into it. So um, let's rewind uh, back to uh, you kind of you working as a teacher in California. And could you just kind of tell us about your journey of how you kind of started uh, at Astra and then got into um, all the other projects that you're involved with? Sure. Yeah. So I I did Teach for America out of college. So I taught for four years in Las Vegas. Uh, so Title I school, so low-income schools, fifth grade. And I ran the gifted program my uh, final year there. And as it happens, there's a, a girl that I started dating and she was living in LA, Chicago kid. So grew up in the cold winters and then moved to LA for, you know, to get away from that basically. And I tried to convince her to move to Las Vegas where I was and she was not having that. So it was uh, clear that I needed to move to LA in order to, uh, to, to be with this person who became my wife, Maggie. And, uh, you know, at the time I, you know, was just applying to other public schools, but at the time there were like lots of, uh, pink slips given out. There are a lot of layoffs happening. So there's really weren't opportunities in any of the public schools in California. So I ended up applying to a school called Merman School for Highly Gifted Children. And that's the actual name. And they're very, very clear about wanting to have the full title. And, uh, you know, I having, you know, grown up in Ohio, like, you know, for for the uh, geographically, you know, near the Great Lakes and kind of like farm country, basically, to go to LA and to be teaching at this school in Mulholland Drive in like Bel Air, like all these like fancy neighborhoods that you hear songs about your whole life, and uh, and movies are you know take place there, and then you see celebrities that like their kids go to this school, and it was this sort of surreal experience. Um, and the other thing that was surreal, besides sort of the pageantry of it all, was just like how basic <laughs> like the school was, like how. Uh, lacking in imagination. The pedagogy was, um, I I had a huge imposter syndrome. Well, I have really basically had it since I set foot on that campus all the way. Well, even from beginning as a teacher, as a 22 year old, your first class, doesn't matter where you're teaching, you're going to feel like an imposter. I remember pulling the kids aside and saying like, does this feel like a normal, you know, is this like a normal class? Does this feel like a normal school year? Um, and so that self-consciousness, I think was definitely true at Merriman as well, where I just expected things to be just vibrant and brilliant and world-class and cutting edge. And it, it just wasn't those things for a number of reasons, which are not necessarily the school's fault. And uh, I was fortunate enough my second year there to meet Elon Musk, who at the time wasn't Elon Musk. He was Elon Musk as someone that like most people maybe had heard of and the people had heard of Tesla or maybe they'd heard of SpaceX. But I would say more often than not, especially in that first year or two, when I said that I'd started a school with Elon Musk, people would be like, oh, like who, like, who is that again? which seems surreal that that's the case that now yeah. it's someone on the space of this earth would not know who Elon Musk is. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Wow. Let's, let's, let's jump into that then. So uh, it, it being at a school, let, I, I mean, we're going to come back to kind of your journey with, with Elon in a second, but being at a school for, for highly gifted students, um, I I know like I'm I'm at like a, a typical state school um, and, and I have a range of, I teach a range of students, but I'm, I'm I always feel a little bit intimidated when I when I'm teaching top sets, 
so top so we have we we set students and when i when i'm teaching the top set i always just feel like a little bit on edge because i know they could like catch me out whereas other cl- this is going to sound really really bad with other classes i feel like i can kind of bluff my way sometimes yeah <laughs> let's, right. just hope, but, let's just hope the school are not listening dan let's just yeah, put it out there yeah that's that's all <laughs> um but with that but with that class i'm like i can't i, like, I need to be on my game so being at a school where where you with highly gifted students like what was that like and and kind of how, how did they select the kids was it was it like was there a test to get in like how did that work yeah, they had an IQ test, as dated as that is. I think they still have it. It's like an IQ of like 138 or above or 145 and some other, you know, and who knows, I don't even remember the IQ test they used. But yeah, an IQ test to even be considered for admission. And then they had about 50 kids per grade level from basically kindergarten through, let's say like eighth grade. So whatever, you know, six-year-olds through 14, 15-year-olds. Uh, it's interesting that you say that though, about like really bright kids or, you know, the, the top set and all that. I think if I do think back, part of it was probably just not wanting to be part of that arms race where I would feel the need to be like, so on point or to just like prove day in and day out that I like knew more or could like think quicker or whatever else. And I think some of the design of projects at Merriman and even before that was like thinking about like, what are the things that all students need more of and what are they not getting in school? And how might I design an experience that would speak to that thing rather than trying to teach them how to factor more efficiently or more quickly or whatever else. So I think maybe, I mean, this is maybe a generous way of interpreting from my perspective, but it was like thinking about what I could do uniquely well and what I'm like, just never going to do uniquely well. And I'll always feel like an imposter or feel sort of like caught out or like be fearful. There's gonna be a moment where students could be like, no, 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 like, you're solving this the wrong way. I mean, God forbid when you're doing like long multiplication on the board and you like mess something up. I just, there's not like the future I wanted to live in where I was like fearful of making a mistake. So rather than, than live that, I guess I just thought like, well, what could I design that would be, that like wouldn't yet exist. And like, that I know that they're going to struggle because we as adults struggle to work collaborative in teams and to like actually have the right disposition towards a complex problem. Like usually we're fearful of them. I mean, I think I can think of like things I've tried to avoid my whole life academically because I was fearful of failure. Uh, and rather than allow them to take that path, just like make that just part of what they do every day. I was, um, I was as you were talking then, I was thinking about my approach to languages. Um, and, and I know that that's for a lot of people that might be maths. It might be, um, it might be languages. It might be instruments. Um, I, I taught, I taught, I, I studied Latin uh, um, at GCSE and A-level. I've talked about this on the podcast a few times. Uh, so, so first of all, I love the names because I see Latin in, in names, but also was fearful because I wasn't particularly good at, um, at speaking languages. I could understand them. I understand the logic of them, but speaking them really feared, feared me a little bit. And I wonder whether like your ideas about how to approach complex things, maybe not, maybe not languages, but certainly how to approach complex things in collaboratively in teams and whatever else. What was it that you, that you tried to, that you tried to develop? Were you saying to suggest ways to, to address complex problems um, in a different way? I, yeah. I think the welcoming nature of a complex problem is something that just often doesn't happen. I mean, like I, it's funny, like I basically spend, or more of my time at this point, like designing games. And I don't play tons of games myself. And in fact, like when I do, like I hate instructions. So I think because I hate instructions, but really enjoy like games and seemingly complex options and like strategic moments, I just felt like, like there must be a way to design something where you can just get right into it. You autumn, you almost like from the outset, see some of the tension between the choices that you need to make but then you're getting that feedback about like how those choices actually play out as it relates to other people. So I think for me, it was always like, how do I make it really welcoming? How do I make the complexity apparent? And part of that was probably just a justification. Like I want, you know, if when parents come in and see their kids playing games in school, there are, or they hear that their kids are playing games in school, I felt like I need to go above and beyond to justify the sophistication of like what the kids were doing, especially when you're in school for highly gifted kids. So, so I think that that was probably the key though, because he's, he's definitely being welcoming. Uh, and then, you know, I would like to design something regardless of what languages you speak or regardless of what like academic level that you're at, that you, you can play the game. 
and they're just going to be higher levels that that game can be played. But like you, you all can play and start to feel some of the tension, even if, you know, you'd look back and like, wow, like I was just playing the sort of the surface level of this, this simulation. So and I'll give you like a quick example. So like in synthesis, there's a game that I'm just finishing work on called fish. The idea is, is that each player has a ship. You select the type of ship. There's pirate ships, there are fast ships, there are uh, big ships. They have different capacities and different speeds. And what you're doing is you're, you're fishing common waters. So of course there's a tragedy, the commons element, which plays out because there's a quota level for each of the fish that are represented by different colors. And once a quota is exceeded, your environmental score will start to drop precipitously. So, uh, and then you're able to cast nets and there's all these like different mechanics that come into it in terms of like where you set up your remote Harbor and how, how, and when you bring the fish to cities and how you avoid piracy and all these sorts of things. But, you know, again, you know, even a, like a four-year-old could play the game, but we could all play and we would probably like looking back, be like, wow, like this is a lot deeper than we ever would have imagined. And I think that that, that is what I'm going for. Four-year-old can play and have a great time. 40 year old could play and be like, wow, like this is quite deep. Like I would really, I would need to spend some time with my team really laying out what strategy makes the most sense to play this game at a high level. Yeah. Um, it's, it, it's interesting that, that your take, your kind of uh, like you, what you were saying about you, you don't, you don't want to be the person who kind of, who, who knows everything, but you want to facilitate that um, kind of the students learning themselves and, and learning and being able to grasp and, and kind of, an amazing example there and of of problem solving on a, on a on a real world level as well um to a certain extent uh how how what how did you feel i'm just going to go back cuz i want to continue this journey as well sure um, how did you feel uh what went through your head when when elon musk asked you to to start school with him Oh, I, I tried to just not ask like the stupidest questions on the face of the <laughs> earth when I was at SpaceX, right? So he, I, I got an email from his assistant. So we had met for like a conference and talked about a few things. His assistant emailed me like the next week and asked if I would come to SpaceX about a potential opportunity. <laughs> you know, so I was like, yeah. So I played it cool. And I was like, yeah, of course, you know, I'll be there. And, if, and of course, you know, I play it cool. And then I like didn't read the instructions with parking. And then I got turned around and then I came late. So as, as flustered as you would imagine you are initially, plus, you know, the compounding first, you know, the compound, the compounding anxiety of being late and all. Um, I, I think it was clear in our early conversations that Elon was just looking for something different. And I felt pretty confident that I could design something that would strike people as different and that I could find really talented people to work with that could kind of build this school and you know, th there wasn't an expectation of trying to scale it immediately. There wasn't an expectation of serving hundreds of kids. I mean, we had all these advantages, which I frankly needed. I was a fourth grade teacher that suddenly is running my own school and I'm working for one of the most powerful people in the world. I needed some time to figure out how to not mess it up, really. Like I needed, I needed to learn some lessons like on my own. And if there was like that really intense microscope, I think it would have been a short, <laughs> a short assignment, so to speak. And then when you're just getting back to the imposter stuff, I mean, I'm not an engineer. I'm certainly not a physicist. I'm not a corporate titan. You know, you're always wondering when you're working for someone like Elon, like, is he expecting me to know like advanced computer science? Like, does he think that I know physics? Because like, I don't. Does he, uh, is he wanting, you know, you're, you're always sort of guessing what it is that someone like Elon might want from you. And really, you know, what Elon really wanted was just like a great school and a great experience for his kids and others. And I think once I realized that, then it, then it was clear. I was like, I am the right person for this and I can do it. But it took a little bit of time to realize that that's actually what he was looking for and not, you know, what he would expect from, from SpaceX or Tesla or something else. He just expected the same thing, but in a different way. So. And was there much time between that kind of those initial conversations and you, you starting it up? Yeah. So the first conversation took place in November. I didn't hear from him until January. And, and in that time, I mean, I really thought that I had imagined hallucinated the whole thing or I'd blown it. Right. Like I, you can imagine like driving home from, from a interview like that. And Elon's like, yeah, like, let's do it. Like, let me know if you're in. And, you know, I'm like, of course I'm in, but, but even just telling your family who think of you as a fourth grade teacher that you're now like, you're going to run the school for Elon Musk and you're going to, be the principal presumably and you have no there's no location there's no salary there's no there's nothing is clear but basically you're just going to do this 
And then, at, you know, I was checking my email like a crazy person for the next, you know, whatever, a couple of days trying to, you know, to see if he would respond. Like, okay, so what are the next steps? And I didn't hear back for two months. So really, I, I thought the project was off. And uh, when it was back on uh, in January, we just had, you know, some series of meetings over the next few months. And we started that following fall in the fall of 2014. And, and you started it as, sorry, Steve. I was just going to say, and that was good preparation for uh, for having a, um, a really young baby the fact that you i wouldn't have slept for two months the fact that i'm waiting for a response from him that must have been good preparation for for having a young kid and, and not sleeping at all yeah i think that's right i think also i mean looking back on it you um i mean i think that i can you know, can't discount the experience of doing teach for america of like you know having 33 students in fifth grade as a 22 year old and really not having any experience as an educator and having to just figure things out so I think there was a lot of confidence, probably some false confidence where even like that summer, I was like looking back, it's like, you know, we traveled sort of widely, my wife and I, like we, you know, I, I would like to think that I mean, now I, I think I, I just feel like I worked so much harder than I did then. I just think I was it's like, this is a cool opportunity. I felt like for whatever reason I was going to be successful, which is like false in so many ways, but I, I just got really fortunate, right? Like I just kind of once in a lifetime opportunity. I had enough time to kind of think about it. It started small enough that I was able to make mistakes. And at the end of the day, uh, it wasn't, the success wasn't like rabid preparation in the summer before because like so many things changed from like the first day, right? As you know, right? We, we always, I think as educators, like romanticize like what we'll get accomplished over the summer, over breaks. I remember always, I still do this. It's like, oh, I can't wait to have a break because I'm going to just get all this stuff done and get ahead. And you almost never do. And the same was even true of this project where you would think like your career is sort of staked on this moment. And even so the casualness, at which I approached it is uh, kind of shocking looking back because I would, if I, you know, from this point on, I would never do something like that again. But, it's, it's, it's mad that all three of us smiled at the same time when you said that about overestimating <laughs> what you're going to do over the summer. Cause we've been talking about writing a book for the last three summers <laughs> and, and, and not done it. And we, uh, so yeah, I know that we're all thinking the same thing. So, so, so you, so you, so you start this school Ad Astra, um, to the stars. What, wh- why, why did you go there? Obviously, is it because it, the SpaceX connection, or is there, is there a wider, wider implication there? That was Elon's name. He liked Ad Astra. Uh, you know, it's one of those like classic space terms. And then they, you know, named a movie after it a few years later. Not after the school, but you know, after that, after the motto. Uh, yeah, no, Ad Astra. That was just the name that he wanted to go with. And then we started in a conference room at SpaceX. We had nine kids that first week. We ended the first year with 16 kids and moved to Gene Wilder's old house uh, off of Sunset Boulevard, a house that Elon owned. So we operated out of a house for two years, basically. And then we moved to the West Campus of SpaceX and we're there from year three through through last year, through year six. So, and yeah, the school went, you know, and this is the reason why, like, you know, a lot of people don't know about the school is like, it wasn't really a, public facing project. It was like a small school. It was mostly for uh, SpaceX children. And, you know, we're on campus, but again, when it comes to the legality of a school on a rocket, a rocket company's campus, it's definitely a, a dark gray area in terms of zoning and all that sort of stuff. So uh, there are reasons to be pretty quiet about the project. And I think, you know, you could imagine like when people, when they hear about it and they want to visit, you really do feel an, an, ob- an obligation might not be the right word, but you feel you feel like it's really important that you show people something different because otherwise, like, what's the real point of it, right? So to, to give just a select number of kids is really exceptional education. Like it's, I, from the outside, I would be like, cool, like, so what? Good for you. You have all these advantages, you have all these privileges and uh, you give these ki- these kids like an amazing experience. Like that doesn't, how does that matter? And I think, from the very beginning, I've been really aware of, I've tried to be really aware of that and conscientious and do work that can be shared and make a school, even if it's small, that can produce either it's an excuse for an educator to try something that's different, or it's something that can like spark an idea for a different educator, or it's work that can actually be shared or projects that can actually be used by students around the world. So that's, so it started this sort of from humble beginnings and it sounds fancier than it was. I mean, you kind of think back in those early days, you have nine kids. There are only so many creative ways to group nine students. You know, you, you need, we needed, we needed, uh, 
we, we needed like dozens of kids to kind of get to where I wanted to go in terms of like the project design stuff. And then we needed partners like Class Dojo to share some of the ideas like conundrums in order to kind of bring this work to more people. Because otherwise I, I, I'm highly suspicious of vanity projects. And to say that Ad Astra was a vanity project is not really fair. I don't think it really added to anyone's vanity. It was just, it was more of a family project and a family project that wasn't widely shared. And family by I mean like Elon and I mean the company. So it's now, so since we've left SpaceX and become Astronova, we now are much more open about what we're trying to do and uh, and who we're trying to serve. Yeah, and it, it kind of, it, it's, it, it shouts out to me that it's, when you're saying it's not a vanity project, it shouts out to me as being some, you, you want to do better? Like, there's, we, we need to do more of that. We need to look around and think, how do we do, how do we do better than this? Because there's a lot of things in our society, especially education, where, we we need to try better we 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 need to we need to think outside the box with this and it sounds like that's that's what you guys did that's what you elon and and the the other guys involved did and and i think it it needs to be applauded really that that people are willing to take a chance on on this uh, because at the end at the end of that people who benefit are our kids and 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 not just our kids but the society that they're going to go into uh which which i think we need to try try harder to do that um I remember reading about you saying that that conference room at SpaceX was like it had glass walls and was uh, and and when I read that I was thinking like the, my immediate thought was of like rocket scientists walking by and and kind of and and just as a as a teacher in that room um, were, were, were they popping in were they interested were they did you were you kind of a bit like oh my god here's this like super intelligent rocket scientist coming in and uh, like. How, how did that? Well, how was the dynamic between the school, the conference room, I guess, and and what was going on around it? Yeah, it was. Yeah, it's terrifying. I mean, I remember. I think someone wrote the wrong equation for momentum on the board, and some engineer like knocked on the door and was like, you know, I forget. Is it P equals M squared? I don't even remember. But it's like this. You need like this is wrong. <laughs> this is incorrect. <laughs> That's cool. uh, yeah. So yeah, I think with the with the company and everything, you know, with you know, Elon, it's Elon's company. So it's never surprising when something like this happens, but to be, to be there on campus was, you know, you, the, the energy is palpable, right? Like from when we started to when we left, you know, they had figured out how to land the, the rockets. They had figured out Falcon heavy and then, you know, starship development had begun. I mean, just there, you just see innovation at scale with like a pace that kind of takes, takes your breath away. And it's hard not to be, it's not, you're just inspired. You're inspired by it all. I remember, you know, we had badges at SpaceX and we, I would just go on Saturdays or Sundays and just do work from there. Just walk through the factory just to, you just look around and just blown away by, by what Elon's accomplished, what the company's accomplished. And for students, I mean, what a cool place to grow up. And I think, you know, getting to, to what you were saying about kind of imagining how things can be different the thing for me that's st- in terms of like with Elon and the way that he thinks about problems that the first principles thing is so important. And especially in education, if you really start from like, what is school? Why school? Those sorts of questions. And then really like ask like, how important is this really? And like, what is the, what are the assumptions and sort of like, what are the things that we just sort of like are, are, are unquestioned? And it's like, oh, well, I don't know, this progression of learning or this exposure that all these things will beget you know, better citizens or more educated citizens, whatever that is. And I I just think because Elon doesn't care about things like accreditation or wouldn't care about, you know, anything that's just based on like assumptions that could easily be disproved. We were able to start with the blank slate and say like, Hey, we have kids between these ages. We have them for these hours. We have them for, you know, these number of days over hopefully this many years, what would be the best, most enlivening way to spend time? And what way could we spend time that would be formative for you as you move away from this place where you would be able to like look back and say those experiences or those moments or those opportunities were so powerful that I will draw from them as I chart my course going forward. So when you think about it in that way, if school really is like these powerful moments, these difficult moments, right? It's not always that everything is great. It's like difficult moments, challenging moments, frustrating moments. How do we put together a collection of moments that you can use as your I don't know. It's like part of your soul as you move on into the world. So what an incredible opportunity to start with that as your, as your starting place for a school, rather than say, well, 
we need you to do this much math or English or science or history or whatever else. And you also will need to follow the accreditation rules to make your school look structured in this way. And of course, there's a block schedule and everything else. I mean, it's a tremendous luxury to start from scratch. I think some people will be terrified, terrified to do that. But for me, that was like the most you know liberating thing I could ever imagine. It's just okay, like, well, you know, what do we do? I don't know. Like what 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 would be powerful and like let's bring that to life. So how are we gonna spend the time best to yeah. to form you for what's coming next? Should we, be the mo- motto of every school. It really we all should. know it's a lot of time. God, I mean, Lord, it's a lot of time that we have kids in school. Like what okay, so what so I think, and also thinking like, what are the outcomes? Like we know, I think we all, this is what's so interesting with education. I think at least in, in the United States, no one really knows what to think about education. So politically, it's one of those weird things where like the lines aren't drawn so clearly, which is refreshing in a lot of ways. But I feel like just about everyone agrees on the outcomes that we want, right? We want people that can like learn independently that are like are adept at collaborating that are you know, magnetized towards solving problems rather than repelled away, uh, that you are able to pursue the things that you most want to learn and can go as deep as possible and have like supporting relationships with, with mentors or educators that can help you along the way. You want to work with peers that are equally like motivated or like also are developing a love for learning. And you want to go through some real, some real difficulty. We all, I think generally agree on those sorts of things. It's just the things that get in the way of the things that we all agree on are things like admission to university or, or I don't know, like the standard way that things have been done or, you know, different superintendent has a vision for how things should be structured. But when you just get down to like what people agree on and then try to just design experiences that are reflective of that, it seems self-evident to me, actually. And it seems it seems odd that we think that things like collaboration and problem solving will just happen because kids are in math or because they're in sports or because they're in these other things. It's like, the the thesis of synthesis is that we should uh, intentionally spend time in these experiences and design them alongside students, not because we have all the answers, because frankly, like we could play a group of synthesis students, they would beat us in like the latest game, even if we had, both of us had never seen it before. And to lean into that thing that students naturally do well and want to do more of, but generally hasn't fit in what we call school because that's only for electives or that's only for things that happen outside of school when really the, the skills and mindsets and memories that all of those are actually more powerful, but we're f- focused on things that are maybe just not as powerful in likely futures. And that's frustrating because I think increasingly students are just calling us on it. And like, this isn't like, what is the justification for this? And they can't be like, well, be- because we say so. Uh, right. It's, it's really powerful hearing that that coming from a, a, a set of parents as well, because because ultimately um, our biggest stakeholder as well as the students is are their parents, aren't, aren't they? Because they're like, you should be doing this. They need to get this. They need to be able to go and do that. And that requires this level of grade score or this level of exam performance to be able to go and do something else. And for for a group of parents to say, no, it's about something much bigger than that. And I think that's what I'm seeing here when it, it, you led nicely into talking about um, synthesis and Astronova. I think that'd be cool to get into about that, that idea that people are, parents are in, in seeing a, a, a greater reason for, for education than just getting, getting a certain score and getting into a certain university. It's uh I mean, this, the acceptance rate at Stanford and Harvard is, I think, less than, you know, I know it is, it's less than 5% at this point. So you can do everything right. You know, you could take every course, you could do everything else outside of school, you could do everything almost perfectly, and you're still, it's it's worse than a coin flip at best, right? Assuming you've done everything else, right? It's just to to spend a childhood trying to gain admission to a university, believing that that is the key to some sort of success or happiness or worth is a fool's errand. And and not only that, it's actually like hugely detrimental to the structure of schools and also to the, 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 the construction of a, of a childhood of a life. And I think what I hope that Astronova can start to to symbolize and, and synthesis as well is to continue doing the types of things that we've seen over these last few years come up where it's, you know, whether it's, 
like Google basically having this parallel track with computer science or things like Lambda School or yeah, I don't know, like just where like you don't you don't need a university increasingly to accomplish the things that you want to accomplish. Now, there's some in some areas like, yes, you will need if you want to become a physician, like you will need to go to school, you'll need a medical school and all of that. But I think for for some where they don't for kids that like don't like school uh, for, for a number of different reasons, there it's it's unfortunate that so many really all types of kids don't like school. And I think sometimes we're just so quick to blame the student when there are so many systemic things. There's so many structural things that make it really difficult to love school and to love learning because like learning in school are not you. The only place it's not that learning is ha- learning is happening everywhere, right? It's happening outside of school. The learn the type of learning that we try to require in schools is increasingly learning that is sort of out of touch with the lived experiences of most of our students. And if we are telling them to go through this endless series of tasks to get to some faraway place called Cambridge or Oxford or Harvard or Yale or MIT or whatever that is, and then, okay, well, then you'll go through that and then then you'll end up this magical place called Google or McKinsey or whatever. I just, I, I think it's right that schools like mine and places like Synthesis start to call out how flawed that is and to just to start to show parents that the things that matter most which is like the kindness, the the capability, the the the, the vision and, and curiosity of your child. That these things are the most important things, and that we will specifically focus on building these. Uh, that that's the thing that's going to matter and endure, because you can't worry about like a child's mental health. Like, well, okay, well, once they get to Google, then like we can worry about that sort of stuff. But until then, it's just going to be a grind, you know. And I also want to acknowledge that like that focus on getting your kid into like top universities is like a really privileged place, right? Like not every parent is thinking that some parents are frankly just want to make give their kid like, you know, they want to give their kid the best thing. And they've been told the best thing is that they need to be doing like math homework worksheets every night. So they're wanting their kids, like, of course, like you want my kids to read. I want my kids to have like numeracy. I want them to be, to be successful, to do well in school, but we need to change what doing well in school means. Like that's the big disconnect. So you have a lot of people in my mind that are sort of going through the system because they believe in it or hope to believe in it because they're not sure what the alternative is. And then you have at the high end, usually of the income level, where people are fretting about like the decreasing chances of getting into top universities. But sometimes that hysteria at the top is masquerading the lived experience of most people, which is you're just trying to get your kid a good education, do right by them, but you're just not aware or have like the cultural capital to know that there's like other stuff out there and that really the thing that might not be like most successful is not your kid just grinding through math worksheets to the point that they end up hating learning and have, you know, and identify as not good at math because they're not good at adding, you know, at the age of eight. And then they carry that on like for the rest of their life. So some of this, I mean, a lot of it is just identity. Like how, how do we create experiences that allow students to think more flexibly about their identity as learners and problem solvers? That, why, why do, that's the key yeah yeah why do why do you think that we we, we continue in a, in a flawed system uh, it's like in the uk we've got more people going to university than than ever before uh however uh based on very various um research reports uh, the, the people who are coming out of university do not have the skills that top companies need i'm um, paying more for it now than they ever have done yeah yeah <laughs> And and it all we 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 interviewed last year um, a former schools government minister called Lord Jim Knight over here, and and he was he he was saying very much the same thing, and he was saying it kind of in order to change the system from kind of uh, what we would call a primary school secondary school level, um, it it has to char- it has to start with the university. The university has to change because the university is almost like the goal. So the sec the 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 further education college before that is it will point towards university. The secondary school will point towards it. And then it's even get the point now where the primary school, like the, the, the elementary school will point towards putting, putting our students on that path early, early on. Um, why is it? Why, why are we, I guess it, it's a, it's a fundamental question to what we do here at Edu Futurist as well. And why do we search the fringes of education for inspiration and for new ways of how to, to be an education system why why isn't this obvious to the people who are running the education systems and i don't know if you can answer that it's just me kind yeah. of thinking right. about it really yeah 
I don't know that I can Etiquette, I can answer that. I do think it's interesting that I agree that universities are the, you know, that need to change because the justification for secondary schools and for middle, you know, in our country, middle schools or junior high schools, and then in elementary schools is you're kind of reverse engineering. You're just doing sort of the same things at a younger, younger age where you're just preparing students for, for admission to university. I, you know, in some ways it would be interesting if parents were more focused on, uh, and even that, this isn't totally right, but even if it was like, okay, well, what will it take for my, but this is the problem is that like when places like McKinsey only hire from top schools or places like that, or you hear that sort of thing, or you just imagine that Google is only drawing from a certain subset of schools, then it just feeds that hysteria. So you're not even like looking beyond university, like, okay, well, this is the, this is the entry point, like this is the destination. And then you know, that stamp of approval from that school will carry, carry its weight going into the future. Why it doesn't change is the reasons why like systems like this are intractable. It's just, it's been done, you know, in, in a million ways there, there is lots, there's tons of innovation. I, I, all the time, especially in public schools, I see all sorts of things that I find to be really bold and, and, and brave and exciting. And if anything, I've been most critical of just the private schools, the schools that have all these resources and have an affluent population. And they, you know, they're just feeding that university, that that beast, the, the admissions beast, basically. Um, in terms of like what what can happen, I I don't I don't know. You know, I don't I I just wonder sometimes. I wonder, I wonder what will happen if it just continues in this way. And there's certainly more parents than ever that are taking the education to their own hands with like homeschooling or alternative forms of schooling. You can imagine like with synthesis as that grows, like more student, you know, parents will be doing that with their kids like more often than, than they are now. Uh, this sort of choose your own adventure piece, I think is definitely rising, but even so it would be really great if we could just figure out how to include more enlivening learning experiences in our schools. I think part of it is that we, ha- I think it comes down to like a, uh, it comes down to a hedging problem. And I think part of the problem is that we're like, ah, like all these things are good. So like, let's do all of them. Like let's do science and history and math and like all these things for all kids, basically all the way through, you know, grade 12. And I just think it would be better if we would be willing to a little bit more of like a moonshot, like a little bit, a little bit less of, of everything, because I feel like just the depth is just not there. I feel like high school science for me, was just like definitions and equations. And I just don't think that that's the type of education that's going to inspire a generation of scientists to solve problems. So uh, anyway, I, I think that that's part of it is that we just try to do too much and we try to do it in the most systematized way possible. And, you know, at the expense of the things that we think are most valuable. Yeah. It's like that. I suppose that exam factory concept, isn't it? Of uh, systematization and can we get this on a, on a conveyor belt and let's get as many people through this simple process. And then, um, and that is that is certainly not what when we've looked at the stuff that you that you're doing synthesis wise that is certainly not what you're trying to do there is it and i know you i know you touched on this idea around games and you talked about that by the way that that fish game just as an idea just sounds like where where do, where do these ideas come from because that's just that's just one but like um it just sounds like it's a, a kind of place where students want to be where teachers want to teach and and also the outcome is they want to. They end up being able to do things that they need to do for the future. What? What? So synthesis. Could you kind of talk to us a little bit about that and what that looks like? Sure. <clears throat> so right now, synthesis is you have an, uh, an hour cohort where you play. I call them at varying times simulations, experiences, games, challenges, puzzles. I mean, most simply, they be recognized as games. And students come together in cohorts from around the world. Uh, there's usually like an older cohort, so like kind of 11 to 14 or a younger cohort, kind of like seven to 10. And what you do is you're sort of just thrown into, that sounds, okay, you are, <laughs> you find yourself in a Zoom, your Zoom room with a facilitator, and then you log in and then you play a game like Constellation or Art for All or Fish. And what you are doing through through that experience is sort of dealing with the chaos because at first you have no idea how the game works. We're not even going to tell you how, how the what keys work, what the instructions are. You have to figure it out. And the first conversation after that first game is basically like, what did you figure out? Like, what do you think is true? And it's one of like the key components of synthesis is testing your assumptions. I mean, the first one is embrace the chaos. 
which is like a don't panic uh, parallel. Uh, and the second one, of course, is to test your assumptions and to assume course corrections. Like those are kind of the three axioms of synthesis. So, and the best way to do that is to actually be the person in power. Like you are making the choices, you're having to navigate uh, these decisions with a team of people that you may or may not know. But to start, you definitely do not know them. And then try to just understand how this thing works. The role of the facilitator is not to tell you the rules or to, to really tell you the best strategies. It's just to become someone who can just help you kind of look in the mirror and, uh, and reflect on like what's working and what's not working and, and what theories you're putting together and then how you're actually testing those theories through gameplay. So the way synthesis works basically is like each of these games you play for somewhere between, let's say like four and eight sessions. And then, so there's this like progression. So you make friends, you're playing the complex games uh, that are always changing because we're, like we're designing them and like making changes like with students as we go. So today, like right before this call, I just played the game of fish. Fish is like 95% of the way done, but that last 5% is an open conversation between me and the students of synthesis about what do you think about fog as it relates to the game of fish? Is it great to conceal where the fish are? Does that kind of risk reward piece, you know, bring about like higher levels of thinking and strategy? Uh, and then in addition to the gameplay, of course, there's like a whole supportive community where we do uh, through Discord. So kids have, you know, their tournaments, there are, are sessions where you play, parents and students play together, teachers and, and parents play together. Uh, there's there's all sorts of stuff there. And I think what's really great about the technological future here as an online, as an online experience is to be able to pull moments, good, bad, and ugly from a synthesis game and to be able to help students reflect on those moments and make sense of them. Because sense-making, as we know, is just sort of like the paramount thing we can do. How do you make sense of what synthesis is, the problems that you're encountering? How do you bring the problems you see in synthesis, the problems that you're encountering in your own life, and tie them to some sort of larger narrative? And I think synthesis will uniquely do that well because well, you have like the mentorship of people that are, you know, are, are committed to doing it at a high level. You have, well, it's really eye-opening when you hear yourself in a team, when you're overbearing and you're talking over your teammates or you're you know very quiet. And when you do offer something, you do it in a way that's like very cutting. It's just like helping students be better, truly better collaborators and problem solvers. And the best way to do that is to do like the hard work of reflection. And I think it's really easy to create an engaging and entertaining experience, but to make it engaging and entertaining and then also reflective is the is the kind of key to synthesis. And, you know, it's not common, I think, that a, an educational technology company, maybe it is common that like teachers that, you know, are part of it. But I think in the past, like Silicon Valley, when it comes to ed tech, just doesn't seem to get it right. And like, we'll get things wrong, of course, of course we will. But I think we have kind of the long view about what we're trying to do, which is to give every kid on the like in this world, the opportunity to have like synthesis as part of their education. And, and hopefully an indispensable part of their education that is the kind of key driver towards confidence and success, you know, beyond school. So that that's the plan, at least. I mean, it's small right now. We probably have something like 1500 students, but we just started less than a year ago. And we hope to, you know, reach 1% of the world's population in the next few years. Like that's the plan to scale it to that, that extent and to make it, you know, widely available, if not free uh, for most people. That's, that's the plan. Yeah, I know you, you guys are getting um, a lot of good investment at the moment. So there's obviously there's a lot of people out there who who are seeing the value and want this want this to be a success. And I think I think it's it's obvious why. How how does the 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 synthesis program um, sit with Astronova? Are they are they kind of one of the same thing? Are they are they two sides of the same coin? <clears throat> uh, so synthesis was the class that I taught at at Astra, the class that I designed. And that's what synthesis scales is. And that's what we do. Astronova is still like a full stack school. It's a fully online. You know, we have chemistry and planetary science and physics and rocketry and, you know, English and, and those sorts of classes. So Astronova has three programs, a full-time program, a one day program, and then a special sessions program. That's once a month. Uh, so we have students that are in both that are in synthesis and Astronova. Uh, Astronova is just a lot smaller. I mean, it's, you know, Astronova is a total of like 150 people. That's sort of the lab. I, I like to think of it in that way. And then synthesis is scaling one of the insights of the school of Ad Astra Astronova. So the students at Astronova, do they do the, do the synthesis as part of their curriculum? 
Yeah, we do that. We do that together. Yeah, right. That's right. Yeah. The, yeah. It could we maybe explore? I know you say it, it hasn't been going uh, very long yet, and you, you're still very much at kind of set the setting up stage. Uh, are you be, are you seeing any impacts already with with the the kids that you you have taken part? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one one of the best things I think to share to get a persp- you know, get a sense of what what the synthesis experience is like is just listening to audio clips of students talking through a problem. Uh, you don't even you don't need to see the video. Just like listening to the audio of students sort of negotiating or 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 uh, planning or you know giving a proposal and then like kind of breaking it down. Like, what are those assumptions? It's really powerful to hear uh, the those clips. The thing I'm excited about is students doing this over many years that synthesis just is like one of those things that of course, like you do, you know, because where else are you getting such a direct experience where you're having to, to, to do these sorts of things. And uh, I think it's also very important to say that I think we would all benefit from synthesis. Like we're just doing this to start with kids, but I, I really believe, well, I don't believe, I know that if, in, in the teams that we work on with the people that we know, like if we did things like sy- synthesis, I think that we would have, we would just feel more comfortable like communicating, especially when things get difficult. We would f- just have like a single better kind of feel for like the social dynamics of a group. And if you really want to do the reflection, I think you'd learn a lot about yourself as well. It's just interesting that we think of like, well, educational experiences end at a certain point, And yet we all know that that's like not true. What we're trying to do at least in my mind, is take the things that, at least for me personally, I found to be like most enlivening about life, which is like working on a highly functioning team, is to be working through problems that like you really are eager to solve, and then bringing that to students at like the youngest possible age, and then just getting them, getting them used to that speed, and then sort of demanding something at or above that speed going forward. Because like once you feel what it's like to be in power and to make tough choices and to see a problem that's always changing but yet you feel confident you can like get some traction on that problem. I just think that that's like the most infectious thing you can do. So it's creating that appetite for problems that, that I, that just really excites me about not only kids that are in it now, but kids, you know, for, for future years and what they'll do with it going forward. I think that's a really interesting concept that you're, you're starting with the process of developing children and you're thinking, right, we'll target them. But actually, how could you target a real old generation and the catch up and the meeting in between where the join up of the skills where the whole population gets communication, collaboration, the critical thinking, the problem solving. I still see it. You know, I, I'm lucky enough to, to lead a team and that ability to, to take the ownership, to problem solve and, and to be critical thinkers at times is a real challenge with some people. And I think it's a skill set that we just don't promote. Like during the UK, we talk about knowledge and we talk about all those aspects but we don't talk about that skill development and where do i sign up do you know can can, can those three be the first adults that sign up to, to, to the program do you know I, I was considering pretending i was an 11 year old i don't it seems like right. i don't have to do it now i i want to do it i want to i want to start having adult cohorts i just i can't i just think some of it's just arrogance right like we we just i don't know once you just realize that you don't have the answers and as an adult, when you can say that to kids that we actually don't know how to play this game at the highest level, like, sure, we could use like, you know, Google's, you know, AI algorithm. I'm sure I could figure out how to play this, you know, at a superhuman level, you know, that's fine, but we don't actually know like what strategies are best. Like you're going to figure it out and you're going to like construct your own meaning through this game as a cohort. And I think the same for adults, like just to go into something like this humbly where, you know, I don't, I just, it's funny when you watch kids who don't know one another, who are around the world on Zoom operate at a level that you would dream about when you get people in workshops or, you know, especially with strangers. Oh my gosh. I'm thinking about professional development workshops to get teachers together. It's like trying to get people to work together is just it's agony. And yet you see these kids who just are so naturally attuned to this, that they're like, and they increasingly get more comfortable in it. And, uh, and then you just support them by making sure like, you know, all voices are heard. And then when there are things that happen where, you know, someone isn't heard from or someone's talking over them to have like the piece to like reflect on that and like what it means and, and how you can course correct, we would all benefit from that. I know I would. And I just, I'm excited to bring it to adults. It seems strange as a, as an educational company to be thinking about serving people beyond the, the you know, the, you know, whatever 14 or 18 or 22 year old age band, but 
I think that's sort of what you need to do to prove that this is something that we all need. Uh, I think, I think, I think we, we're sold. We're all sold. I think he, I think he also set solves in that idea that it doesn't seem like this is just about preparing students for a future, although that happens. I think that does happen. I, I love, I love the the mantra around um, building a life of so that students can live a life of meaning and joy. So they actually enjoy that and it feels like it's purposeful. And I know that's part of the, the, the kind of purpose of, of what synthesis is about that students really get some, some sense of there's an achievement intrinsically, but also a joy in learning and solving a problem, making good judgments, all that. I, I think it's just, just fits the bill. Yeah. Appreciate that. Yeah. It's uh it's a fun time. I'd love to have you all come come watch and <laughs> and play, participate. Yeah. Because people see it and they think it's about the games. And like, yeah, the games are are clever and, and they're always evolving, but it's it's about the experience, shared experience that you can have where you care enough about it to lean in and and give your authentic and current self and an openness to like evolve that self to be, yeah, like a to be like a jo- hopefully like a joyous, ethical, kind you know, deeply efficacious person. Like that's the goal. This is just a place to do it. Yeah. I think I just, I'm excited for that, for the world when that, when that generation of kids go out into it and, 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 and get the, get the jobs in, in, in the companies that, that can then make a difference. Um, I really think, I mean, I know we, I know we've, we've talked about Elon Musk, but the kind of that mindset of, of what we're doing here is we're problem solving. I guess he takes he takes that into kind of all of the different industries that he works in. Um, and if we have if we have a, a generation of of children and and then and then adults who were whatever whatever career they go into, they could they could they could go into SpaceX, but they could go into the 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 local shop fruit and veg shop down the road. Whatever whatever they go into, they've got the skills to be able to problem solve within a few decades, we're going to live in a different world, completely different world. That would be great. Wouldn't it yeah, <laughs> that would be really great? Yeah. We, we want this generation to be, uh, you know, orders of magnitude better in every way than we are, right? Like, that's the greatest gift that we can give them. It are like the tools and the experiences that will allow them to shape a much better future and will not make this, you know, the same mistakes that we've made. So like, let's like, so what are the experiences that are going to like, are likely to beget that sort of thing? Like I think synthesis is at least, you know, it helps open that conversation. My wife, um, my wife regularly says that people who don't have any kind of proactivity or any kind of initiative really frustrate her. And I feels like what's, what's going on here is there's a, there's, you, we're building that sense of kindness that that sense of enjoyment in le- like wanting to learn and being reflective but also like you said this is about being intentional and about being proactive about solving problems and like i think this is this is i look at my children and rather than when they do something because they feel it's the right thing to do whether they put their things in a dishwasher or they make sure that they take the trainers upstairs, like that is way better than them being told to do it. So I think that's what this allows, isn't it? That, that, that level of, of proactivity and intention and, 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 and being, being better people. Yeah. School is like the waiting place, right? You're just waiting around for something to happen, for someone to tell you what to do, for someone to give you the lesson for, you know, it's just, you're just not in a position. You don't feel alive. I think. Um, or you do, or sometimes what you do, because there's like, you just sort of like a magical teacher or like there's, there's just, or you just are making friends. Like there's magic in school, but the learning experience as it's designed on paper is not magical. What if the learning experience on paper or in software, like was actually magical and, and that you are learning that when you have control, when you have like, when you feel like your decisions matter, what better way like, like, I just think that that that's the thing that's just not happening enough is that you're like able to make decisions in school that matter beyond you're getting evaluated for some sort of like far off goal or whatever, like getting your marks for, for your report card, whatever that is. What if you'd made decisions and that we weren't worried about where you stack up on some scale or where you're going to be placed or whether you're going to get accepted or not, but basically that we are invested in your story and your growth. And that's what matters. And like, we're going to like work with you 
to make those improvements. Like that just to me, this seems, you know, why that would, yeah, like I, I wish I had, I wish I had this, right. I wish I had that at the age of eight or 10 or 12 or whatever that is. It's just uh, to, to take a step back from the evaluation and to think more about the investment in the individual and the collective group of individuals. Like that's the thing that I, I think schools can do a better job of doing. And I hope that synthesis becomes, whether it comes through the company of synthesis or it just, it's called synthesis or it's called by something else, but that this concept, this thing becomes an indispensable part of every kid's education. That will be success in my mind. Yeah. I think it yeah. goes back to what you were saying before as well, which, which really resonated with me about, about allowing our kids to discover their identity. And I, I don't think to be part of a team, you need to know who you are first, don't you? And, and I think we, we, if we're missing that, that stage out of development, um, maybe, maybe that's, maybe that's some of the issues that we're, the reason why we've got some of the issues we're having with education yeah um it's it, it's to, i'm like i'm inspired now um i don't know how i'm going to go back to work on monday morning and, and not want to change the place uh, before 10 o'clock so uh, <laughs> uh it's yeah it's 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 just great to i think this is why we do this to 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 speak to to, to people like you josh and uh, and to, to to spread to spread the idea that that things don't have to stay the same things can can change and and th- and there's there, there are there's better things we can be doing with our kids like i know it sounds so basic but they deserve i think personally i think they deserve so much better have you ever before before we do wrap up have you i was thinking you know a lot of the kind of conundrums um uh, are are hypotheticals and 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 you can tell that they're, they're they're based on on some real life scenarios but have you ever thought about maybe after after the kids kind of get get used to the problem solving, actually giving them some like real world issues from from companies or or from governments around the world and seeing how they handle them? Yeah, that's a good idea. I think so. Conundrums are written for for Class Dojo, so <clears throat> they have a younger audience. Uh, but you're right; these these things, if if they don't echo, they certainly yeah they they more than echo like real real conflicts that we have. I do think that, yeah, like whether they're case studies or other opportunities, I think just that choice between seemingly equivalent options is like really important. Uh, and I think conundrums are a nice job of kind of modeling that, that technique. Uh, I think for older kids, yeah, absolutely. I mean, what, you know, especially for like educators that are like wondering, like, how can you bring something that's just going to, I don't know, just give your students a little bit more of like the feel of something like synthesis. I would just recommend things like conundrums, or just like drawing up a question where there are like three or four or five am- answers that are all defensible in some way. Because we're doing this all the time where kids are making judgments, evaluations, what's better than this? Which of these would you pick? I mean, we're doing this stuff all the time. It's just, unfortunately, when it comes to like persuasive thinking or persuasive writing in schools or team <laughs> team projects in schools, we're just, we just haven't made those experiences good enough. We're asking people to write you know, like school uniforms or no school uniforms. We're asking them, you know, should the school day start earlier or later? Like, what are the trade-offs? Like, okay, but why don't you give them like, I don't know, give them more openness in terms of the different options and then be willing as a teacher to your opinion, just one of many. It's not the opinion or like the answer or the authority. You are just one person who believes in this conundrum that the animal should be returned to its home country. You know, it's just something like that where it just, it humanizes, I think in that relationship between students and teacher, I think is that's really important to humanize that and to just take a step back and say, I'm just a human trying to answer this problem the best I can. And my answer is based on a number of things, which I can lay out here, but it's really cool that you disagree with me. Like, let's talk about it because that constructive disagreement is something that we are just sorely missing in this world. We can disagree and not hate one another. It's okay. I think it's just important that we start that really early on. Um, yeah, that's yeah. yeah, that's right. Josh, uh, thanks for joining us for the for this more in depth conversation for the podcast, and a massive thank you for for doing our keynote talk at the Edu Futurist Awards 2021. If you missed that, get yourself over to YouTube, uh, youtube.com forward slash Edu Futurist to catch up on on Josh's talk there. Uh, Josh, have a lovely day, and and thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, of course. Take care, guys.